Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's program, Beyond Abigail, um, and other notable Quincy women in the hunt to find them. Uh, we are very happy to be joined tonight by Alexandra Elliott and Ed Fitzgerald. Alexandra is the curator at the Quincy Historical Society, and Ed is the executive director of the Quincy Historical Society. Um, both have extensive experience talking about the history of Quincy. They have been uh, co-presenters for programs with us and many uh, programs over the years, and we're delighted to have them back for tonight's program. And welcome. Thank you guys both very much for coming tonight. Thanks for yeah. having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, always happy to uh, be working with you again. All right, and I'm going to turn it over to you guys. All right. Um, so I will uh, just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us here tonight, and I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen so we can start uh, getting going. All right, so once again, thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. Um, uh, as Carrie said, we'll be talking about uh, some women's history, and particularly we're talking about notable Quincy women um, throughout all of Quincy history. And also at the end, I'm gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about how we actually go about finding these individuals and telling the stories of women's history, which tends to be overlooked in a lot of the historical records. Um, and so just a couple disclaimers before we get started. So first of all, this is not a comprehensive list of every single notable Quincy woman in, in history. Uh, there are of them and if we talked about all of them we would probably be here until about next Friday or so and I'm sure you all have things that you need to do in that time so uh, we're not gonna <laughs> talk about everybody so this is a, a slightly cut down list so if we miss one of your personal favorites or something or we're not talking about someone that you really like you know it's it's not on purpose uh, we just had to be selective with who we decided to talk about tonight um, Second thing is that this isn't actually quite the story that we wanted to tell. Um, you know, this is going to be talking about a lot of different people from a lot of different eras, and that can sometimes get a little bit confusing. So this, this that's traditionally not how people like to present histories. Um, so this is, this is interesting, and it will be, um, it, it, it kind of shows you the start of a process and the start of some research that we are actively engaged in working in to be able to better tell these stories, essentially. Um, and then lastly, uh, title this program Beyond Abigail, which is somewhat provocative, in, um, which is not to say that we are suggesting that we should be ignoring Abigail Adams because we absolutely should not. I love talking about Abigail, absolutely. Um, and But, she is also an incredibly bright star um, in this universe and in the history of Quincy. So sometimes it can be that uh, some other very significant individuals don't get as much attention because uh, she is just so brilliant in and of itself. So tonight we're just kind of taking a step back from talking about Abigail just for tonight and so that we can talk about some other really uh, remarkable people. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, let's get started. So first up, I'm talking about this in terms of how did we actually, how are we organizing this talk here tonight? Um, so I've ended up going thematically and it's actually rather difficult to have a, a list of about uh, almost 20 or 30 women and, and how to organize them in a way that would actually be sense and be a compelling narrative. It's very hard to do. Um, so the way that we decided to talk about it is thematically. So we're going to be talking about women in the public sector, so public office and public service, academia, um, and then also business, sports, and the arts. So this is one of the really interesting things is that also you have uh, significant women from Quincy history throughout all of these different sectors. Really, in every single different sector of our of our society, you can probably find someone um, of note. Um, so we'll be talking thematically, but we're going to start... Um, by going back to some pre-colonial and colonial day stuff. Then we'll move forward a little bit. And we're going to actually bounce around through time, skip through time a little bit, which might get a little bit confusing. So please just bear with us. And if you get confused, we apologize. We'll try and make it as clear as possible. We'll, we'll try and tell you what year it is, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> we'll try and make it as clear as possible. Um, all right. So moving 
into our first period here. Um, so first of all, I want to get started off tonight by discussing um, not really a single individual, some of the roles of women within the groups of masculine <laughs> people um, in the area in the pre-colonial period. Now, uh, our, particularly, I want to talk about this generation of the Massachusetts leaders that were um, involved it with the uh, interacting with the first waves of English settlers. Um, one of them being Chickatobit. Now, uh, he was the sachem of the group of Massachusetts that lived essentially in the area between the Blue Hills and the coastline, and that includes uh, much of modern day Quincy. So he was kind of, he was in control of this area, and he also had control of the area known as Shamit Peninsula, which eventually became the town and the city of Boston. Shaban Peninsula belong, or was un, he had control of that land, so he actually was the one to deed it to the Puritans in uh, 1630. But his territory bordered up against the territory of a very famous uh, local female leader, which whom you can see um, depicted in a uh, a flagstaff and a bronze flagstaff in Arlington, Massachusetts. So she uh, was a female sachem. Uh, uh, and she was referred to the female sachem of Mystic. Now, Mystic refers to the Mystic River, the Mystic Lakes. Uh, so not Mystic, Connecticut, but in fact, the area that we probably would call Medford today in Massachusetts. So she was apparently a very formidable um, leader. She had inherited her post from her husband after he died. And so she and her three sons actually divided up his very large territory, which uh, her sons took over, I believe it was Lynn, Revere, um, and some of the, the communities to the north of Boston. And so she had control of Medford what and what was called Cambridge and Watertown. And she was actually the one who deeded that land to the uh, Puritan settlers as well. Um, so she had control over quite a large um, swath of land in Massachusetts. And she's written about um, in the contemporary uh, documents as being a very uh, capable leader. So she's not related to Quincy directly, but since you do have uh, a lot of their territory butting up against each other, there it's you know very possible that there was some uh, either trade or potentially conflict between the Massachusetts of the, Qu the Quincy er area, or what we call today Quincy, and uh, this particular individual. But I do want to bring this up because uh, we do actually have, or unfortunately, we do not know her name, and we don't know the name of the person that I'm going to talk about next either. And this is Chickatobit's mother, who was not necessarily a leader of her community, as far as we're aware, but she was buried on a hill known as Passanagesset, which is today referred to as Mount Wollaston. Um, so you can see an illustration of Mount Wollaston from uh, the New English Canaan of Th Thomas Morton by Charles Francis Adams, talking about the history of uh, Old Braintree and Quincy. And so this area was uh, very close to Chickatobbit's, one of Chickatobbit's headquarters in Quincy, which is known as Maswatusset Hummock, which is a kind of a, a tree knoll uh, on the coastline right up at the north end of Wollaston Beach. You can go and visit there today. And so that was one of his main settlement areas. So very close by within eyesight um, would have been this place where his mother was buried. And there's a, a, a story in um, Thomas Morton's book, uh, The New Canaan, uh, talking about uh, Chickatawba being very upset because the English settlers had disturbed some of the bear skins on his mother's grave, which suggests that she had a very important um, position within her community. Um, and so this was a, uh, these were cultures that did certainly give quite a lot of respect and, and, and sometimes quite a lot of power to women in their community. So I did want to start by talking a little bit about Native American history here. Anything you want to add there, Ed? Uh, just that uh, Chickatawba's mother presumably passed in during that terrible, terrible epidemic that was really an, a pandemic mm -hmm. that really devastated the native population along the coast uh, from Maine down to, to the Cape a few years before the permanent settlement at, at, uh, at Plymouth begins. Um, and also that um, when Miles Standish and a few people from 
uh, Plymouth in the fall of 1621 first kind of explored Boston Bay and made their landfall at Squantum, being guided by by Tisquantum, one of the first people they hear about is the Squaw Sachem. Uh, she is one of the first, when they begin talking to the native population, she is one of the first people that is mentioned as being a, a very powerful person and a person of, of you know, real consequence. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so moving on through history here, we're going to move into uh, a little bit, a, cu a couple years later, so not too far away down the line um, in terms of uh, historically, but we're at this point, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Anne Hutchinson, who is personally one of my favorite <laughs> uh, individuals to talk about because I find her fascinating and I find this period very fascinating. Um, but Anne Hutchinson was a Puritan woman who lived, had, so, had land uh, deeded to her, her, she and her husband in Quincy. Um, or in Old Braintree, as the case may be, and but li spent quite a lot of time living in Boston. Um, but sort of straddled between the society of Boston and the community in what would eventually become Quincy. So she's born in England um, in 1591, and she becomes embroiled in one of the biggest legal and religious controversies of the 17th century. This is known as the antinomian controversy. Um, so this becomes, she is eventually put on trial, as you can see um, in the left-hand picture there, that's an illustration of her at her trial. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But it's also very interesting because she comes from a family that her father had been jailed back in England at one point for being uh, for some heretical thought. Um, but she, and she seems to have taken up that mantle as well. And she seems to have been a woman who was very much um, uh, who stood out quite a lot in her community. And that was not necessarily a good thing to do in Puritan society. So to explain the antinomian uh, controversy, this is a very complicated thing and has to do with a lot of metaphysical and a lot of the minutia of Puritan uh, theology. So I'm going to try and explain it in as, as simply as I can because it is something that I had to read several times to just try and get because it's very, very confusing. Um, but the first thing that you need to know is that and most, most, I'm sure that most of our audience probably already knows this, but uh, baseline is that the Puritans, one of the, the fundamental tenets of their religion is that they believed in predestination. So that when you are born, you, your, the, the status of your soul has already been predetermined by God. When you die, you will either go to heaven or hell, and God already knows no matter what you do in your life, that is the case of it. So that was one of the central tenets of their religion. Um, and part of their teachings, especially in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, was that uh, involved the idea that you would be able to kind of tell who had been um, destined for heaven or hell based on their acts on earth. So if uh, you were a bad person and you did bad things, well, that must mean that you're going to hell. Or if you did only good, good things, good works, uh, then you must be saved. Um, so this is somewhat of a contradiction because if the first tenant is true that everyone is predestined, well, then how, what, what would it matter what you do in life? And so that that's kind of the main, or one of the main areas of the antinomian con controversy is that the, uh, is that Anne Hutchinson and several of her allies and, and uh, religious um, followers believed that that didn't make any sense. And so, um, as what would happen is that um, you, or she, or she began to teach against it essentially is what happened. And so namely that if you were already saved, uh, you could be a terrible person and it wouldn't matter uh, because you had already been predestined. Um, and she also started teaching about something called free grace. And a lot of people in her community started talking about free grace, which is essentially that um, the personal revelations that you get through your study of the Bible and whatnot is equivalent to the teachings within the Bible itself. And of course, that was something that the uh, political and religious authorities of Massachusetts Bay Colony, which were one and the same, uh, did not like. And they especially did not like that it was a woman who was teaching these things and spreading these ideas. That was very threatening to them. Um, so after a few years, word gets to the people in Boston, to the, some of the higher ups there that 
Anne Hutchinson and her allies have been preaching this idea of free grace and et cetera, and uh, they put her on trial. This is truly for them. They consider it an existential crisis. The way that John Winthrop writes about this, uh, who was the, uh, the governor of Massachusetts at the time, he is writing about this as if this were the, the greatest threat that their community had ever faced, because that, that's what it was in their mind. Um, so the trial is held. She and her allies are banished. Um, so the right-hand side of the screen, you see a statue that is on the, uh, on the outside of the Massachusetts State House grounds today. And that is a picture of, or a statue of Anne Hutchinson uh, shortly after her banishment and as she is leaving Massachusetts. So from Massachusetts, she eventually goes to Rhode Island where she lives for a few years until her husband dies. And at that point, she goes to what is then New Netherlands which will eventually become New York and moves to a, an area that will eventually become the Bronx. Um, but at that point was much more uh, wilderness. And very sadly, she was actually killed about two years later in 1643 in a conflict with the native, local Native American groups. So she had a very, very tragic um, life story, but very, very fascinating. Um, and certainly someone that I've interesting. Anything more to add, add there, Ed? Um, I think we can't really, as people know from all sorts of people are, are I think, aware of this, but you really can't underestimate uh, the importance and influence, uh, which often, un, for many years, unrecognized of Hutchinson on oh. any number of aspects of American life. And her influence and of her circle in, in Quincy is really one of the great eternal mysteries of, of local history. So uh, she really is one of our most significant uh, figures. Mm. Uh, and it, you're right. I mean, the point you make that she, it's, uh, it's not only that she is teaching something that they find heretical, but that, she, that is a woman who is doing it. I, when Winthrop charges her, he, one of the things he says is that she is doing things that are unseemly for your sex. Mm. Uh, you know, so she she stands as a very fascinating, complicated figure. I think you're right, absolutely. Indeed. Can I add something? Can I add something? Uh, in Wollaston, there is an Anne Hutchinson marker on the Wollaston, uh, on the Hillside Street. Yep. So that is the only memorial we have in Quincy uh, marking Anne Hutchinson. Yep. Yes. So on a, yep. In a pudding stone plaque there. That was, yep. yeah. thank you. Thanks, Anna. And I believe that is the, um, the Ed, you can corroborate this. I believe that is the, um, the location of where her family's uh, land was. Yeah, it, it, the, the oh, farm yes. it covered a lot of Upper Wollaston and North Quincy, sort of west from Newport Avenue, and really kind of going over, you know, the Hutchinson Hill in, in Milton. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it went across the line and into what becomes Milton, too, yeah. Also, minor side note, the governor of Massachusetts at the time of the revolution, Thomas Hutchinson, was a distant uh, a direct descendant, yeah, like a direct direct. descendant of, yeah. um, of Anne. So yeah. something to, to think yeah. about. Um, moving along now. Um, so, of course, talking about Quincy, uh, you have to talk about the Quincy family. And one of the most famous and most well-known uh, Qu Quincy woman was Dorothy Quincy. Now, the problem is that there are, in fact, three of them. <laughs> um, there was Dorothy Flint Quincy, who is not pictured on this um, slide here. You have Dorothy Quincy Jackson, who was uh, the daughter of Dorothy Flint Quincy, um, and, but about whom the, the famous poem uh, Dorothy Q was written by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Um, so she is pictured on the left-hand side of your screen there in the green dress with the red shawl. That is the Dorothy Q. Um, and then her either niece or great niece, I can't remember exactly where she falls in the, um, the, the lineage, is Dorothy Quincy Hancock, who is the first first lady of Massachusetts married to John Hancock. Um, so she was born and raised in the Quincy home um, and, uh, and lived there until for about the first 10 years of her life until the family actually uh, could no longer afford the house and lost it. Um, now, something that I actually find very interesting about Dorothy Quincy Hancock is that we don't know much about her. We know the basics of her biography, where she lived, when she lived there, that sort of thing. But 
Um, we don't know much about her thoughts on the revolution, on what her husband did, on, on many things at all, uh, because she, unlike many of her contemporaries, where we have such as Abigail Adams, of course, um, also Martha Washington, Mercy Otis Warren, who were prolific writers, who wrote journals, wrote letters, um, and thus we get a much better, clearer idea of how their mind and what they thought about things. Dorothy Quincy Hancock did not write very much, and she and she and John Hancock did not write to each other very often, despite being separated quite a lot. Um, and or and if she did write to other individuals, friends, or family, not many of them survive. And so this is going to be a theme that you're going to see repeated throughout this program: is so much of history is really based on luck and what survives and what remains and what we still have access to and what we can still read. And thus that, that helps us uh, formulate better pictures of the various uh, individuals or times or events that we're talking about. So this is, this is something that a theme that you're going to hear recurring throughout all of this. Um, and Ed, would you mind uh, taking on Louisa Catherine? Okay, sure. Uh, <laughs> Louisa Catherine, of course, uh, is the wife of uh, John Quincy Adams, uh, born Louisa Catherine Johnson. She is um, an American in that her father was a Marylander, but who was living in England at the time of her birth because he was representing commercial interests of Maryland to the, to the crown. This is obviously before the revolution. So in that sense, she is the first foreign born first lady of, of, in the United States. And she's really sort of an interesting figure um, because there are people who find, there's more than a few people, there's actually quite a number of people that find her very fascinating, including her, I guess it would be her grandson, Henry Adams, the author, who has very, in his autobiography, has very vivid memories of her seeing her as a young boy uh, and this kind of uh, very graceful, very kind of, but slightly distant and slightly uh, self-contained figure that is, is almost kind of mysterious to him. And then many people, uh, many historians and, and students of history going forward, including um, Paul Nagel, who was for three or four books on the, on the Adams family. His book, Louisa, uh, his book, Adams Women, he describes as Louisa Catherine as being the heroine of that, that book, which includes, of course, also Abigail and Abigail's sisters and any number of other people. Um, to the point that uh, Alexandra was making about Dorothy Quincy and how we don't seem to have a paper trail for her the way we do for Abigail and a number of other people. Louisa Catherine being a generation younger also shows something that I think we're going to see at least once more with uh, figures coming up, but particularly for this women who were in, uh, in their youth, their young adulthood and into their older adulthood in the first half of the 19th century. Um, she was a, a woman of considerable talent. I mean, she, she was musically talented as you see in the, in the portrait uh, she composed uh, pieces of music that uh, were actually performed uh, for church. She was a member of Christ Church here in, in Quincy rather than First Parish Church uh, because of her Anglican background uh, or Episcopalian background. And she wrote a couple of narratives. I mean, she wrote a couple of autobiographical narratives, uh, one of which tellingly was described, she titled uh, diary of a nobody, which kind of tells you something about what's going on there, but also one about that very harrowing journey she had from St. Petersburg to Paris during the 90 days that Napoleon is back trying to, to, uh, to seize power, but she kept them to herself. And I think that as we move from sort of those engaged women that Alexander was describing, like uh, Abigail and uh, Mercy, or, or, or Mercy Otis Warren, you start getting into this era of gentility where remarkable women kind of kept their light under a bushel and, and kind of kept it in a, in a kind of domestic, more domestic sphere. We'll see that coming up a little bit. It's going to be, I think, one of the one of the trends we will see here. Yeah. Yeah. So, there we go. There we go. Um, so. Moving into some a little bit more modern at this point, and also moving into some of the thematic um, areas. Uh, at this point, I, I do want to talk about uh, 
women in public office in Quincy. And this has been an interesting uh, subject for us, um, especially for these first two women, uh, because for quite a long time, we were under the impression that Mabel Adams was the first uh, woman to ever serve in public office, to be elected to a public office in Quincy. And she was elected to the school committee um, in, I believe it was uh, 1895. She then served three consecutive three-year terms after that, so serving for a total of nine years. Before that, she was already a very highly accomplished woman. Um, she is a descendant of the V. Adams family of Quincy. She's born in 1865, uh, becomes a teacher at the Horace Mann School for the Deaf and the Hard of Hearing. Uh, and then from 1919 to 1935, she was a principal at the same school. She was a suffragist a very um, and also a very ardent advocate for disability rights, especially for those who were hard of hearing. So she was a very highly accomplished woman in, in her time. And up until relatively recently, we believe that she was the first woman to, to, to serve in public office in Quincy. But as it turns out, it was Adelaide A. Claflin, Claflin who you'll see on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, so she was a Boston native, or at least born in Boston in uh, 1846, but then moved to Quincy after her marriage. So and she and lived here for a, a good number of years. So she had been very well educated for a woman at the time, uh, having received some private instruction from Harvard professors, which is very uh, interesting. Uh, she had a passion for theology, and that is something that repeats throughout the, her entire life. She also has a talent for public speaking. She's apparently a very lively and passionate uh, speaker and presenter. So she ends up becoming a suffragist, getting involved in that movement, and going on the speaking tour circuits around Massachusetts and New England. So she's walking all, or going all over and giving presentations for large crowds to essentially try and get them to support suffrage initiatives. She also petitions the Massachusetts uh, State House for a suffrage um, bill in Massachusetts and that she is ultimately unsuccessful there. Um, but during all of this, she is also elected to the, once again, the school committee in Quincy in 1884. Um, and then she, which she serves uh, for a term of three years. So she is, in fact, the first woman elected to public office in Quincy at, at about uh, 10 years before Mabel Adams was. Uh, and she, after leaving um, the school committee, she then eventually decides that, you know, it's really ministry is her real passion. So she ends up leaving public service altogether and becomes a minister. Um, now, what's really interesting, and, and I like to point out when talking about these two women, is that both were elected before any woman could actually elect them. Um, so uh, they were both elected before the, the suffrage amendment was passed. So that is that I find that quite interesting. Anything to add here, Ed? Uh, no, I think that's basically it. I, uh, they um, uh, both served on the school committee. Uh, you see the emerging public role, and of course the public role becomes linked for women to the care of children one way or the other, uh, either through the school committee and also um, in the case of Mabel Adams as, as a teacher at, she taught of, of, of disabled children in the Boston Public Schools. Um, but wider interest for both people. I mean, both people had you know, a much, not that there is anything, it, the care of the children is obviously a, a, a truly significant thing to be doing, but they had interests beyond that, that they would not find a public expression for it all that easily. And Adelaide kind of fought for it, yeah. Um, so sticking with the theme here, moving to the next slide. Um, so continuing with public office, with um, women in public office, the first female city councilor was uh, Edna A, or was Edna Austin, who was elected in 1943. And then she served for uh, about 15 years with a little bit of a gap in between there. Um, now, what's also interesting is that we found this in a book uh, written by the former mayor of Quincy, Frank McCauley, uh, his book, Quincy, Massachusetts, A Political History, 1899 to 2000. We have this table here, this chart, uh, highlighting or detailing every single woman who had served in city government from 1889 to 1999. 
And the ones that are highlighted in yellow are women who served on city council. So you, do, you only have in a hundred years, three women serving on city council in Quincy uh, up until two, the year 2000, really. And what's also interesting is that since the year 2000, in the last 20 or so years, we've had three more women serving on city council. Uh, so the record's getting a little bit better on that one um, and hopefully many more to come as well, yeah. including the two uh, city councilors that are serving today. Exactly. Oh, sorry, if anybody like me had a little bit of difficulty figuring out the initials and what they stood for, I got SC for school committee. I got Ward, obviously, CAL. I should have gotten that right away, but maybe it isn't as, maybe for other people, it, isn't, it means counselor at large. He was just distinguishing counselor at large rather than award counselor. Yeah. Indeed. Um, so moving into the sphere of public service, so not too far away from public office, but um, not so much in the elected sphere. Um, I wanna talk about this woman and it's in both of these images are depicting uh, or focusing on the same woman, this being uh, Mary, Mary Dusen, also known as Molly Dusen. Uh, so she is one of the key officials of officers uh, within the government or within the bureaucracy of the government. So she wasn't elected, but she was uh, sort of an operative within the Democratic Party and then also with different agencies uh, and she was really had quite a lot of influence in implementing and instructing and teaching people about the New Deal. Uh, so she was actually a personal friend of Eleanor Roosevelt, and that ended up bringing her into uh, politics and then the world of public service that way. So she was born in Quincy in 1874, graduated from Wellesley University. Um, at, or, while she's doing some other social work, uh, she is, that's how, when she meets uh, Eleanor Roosevelt at, in New York, uh, who recruits her to um, join into some of her initiatives. So she becomes, she is a union representative at the time, but, and a social worker, she ends up getting involved in the suffrage movement. Uh, she serves in World War I as a nurse. She gets uh, tapped to be, after uh, World War I, she gets tapped to be the head of the women's division of the Democratic Party. So she is essentially a co-chair of the Democratic Party. Um, she then helps create uh, something called the Reporter Plan, which is essentially a training program, a, a nationwide training program for women about the New Deal that was uh, hugely influential in making it a success. Um, and then she was a the one of the first or a member of one of the first of the first social security board which is what you see uh shown on the left hand side of your screen there an image of uh three of the social security board members that being uh mary Dusen, george big and um oh excuse me mary Dusen, arthur altmeyer and uh george big mm -hmm. and then uh on the right hand side of your screen you have an image of she and her lifelong partner polly porter uh, in the Bronx, and they had a, a farm together in in Massachusetts. I, I forget, I'm blanking on the name of the town where they had their where they had their house, but um, they were together for most of their lives. Mm -hmm. Anything to add there, Red? Uh, just that we're moving as we start to move into this group of women that are born in the late 19th century and live into the first half of the 20th century. You begin to see sort of a change, but that'll be we'll pick that up as we keep going on and then we can talk about it more generally, I think. Um, next up, I want to talk about Mary Parker Follett. Now, I, I preface this as a, a woman in academia, but really you could also call her as a, an individual working public service as well. A lot of these women, they do so many different things um, that it becomes hard to just pin them down as one thing, uh, as, as, as I'm sure is, is, is not surprising. Um, so Mary Parker Follett was a very prominent social worker and philosopher, philosopher of organizational theory. Uh, she was an author. She wrote many um, treatises, books, essentially talking about uh, management theory, essentially. So how, how does one organize or how does one manage an organization or manage a group of people? And um, they were very widely read and very widely put into practice, so much so that she actually, towards the end of her life, get, get um, tapped by President Theodore Roosevelt to be an advisor to him. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later, too. So she's born in 1868 in Quincy. She goes to Radcliffe College and then also 
goes on to attend several other prestigious universities as well, I believe University of Cambridge in England. Uh, she goes to, I believe, MIT for a while as well. She applies to Harvard, but they don't allow women yet, so she doesn't get in. Um, and she has just a, fit, uh, a London School of Economics is also uh, a place that she attends uh, at various points. So she is a very, very well-educated woman. Um, and over the course of her career, she writes three books on manage managerial theory. And she defined management as the art of getting things done through people, which does make a lot of sense. Um, and the quote that I have here on the screen is from her book, The Creative Experience from 1924, which states, uh, leadership is not defined by the exercise of power, but by the capacity to increase the sense of power among those led. The most essential work of any of the leader is to create more leaders. Um, so this, I thought this quote was a very good um, explanation of her philosophy and, and uh, why people may have found that compelling and interesting. Like I said, she does get um, brought into Theodore Roosevelt's administration in, in, an, um, in a consultation uh, position to es essentially help him uh, and to advise him on matters having to do with the management of nonprofit organizations and government organizations, et cetera. Moving along here. So a few more women in academia. Um, we have Alice Bach Gould. So she is also a descendant of the Quincy family uh, through her mother's side. And she is a historian and a mathematician. So she was born in Cambridge um, and spent most of her life after school in Puerto Rico and South America uh, in Spain, and she, she spent a lot of her time studying the lives and, uh, of Christopher Columbus and uh, Queen Isabella of Castile. So she uh, specifically <laughs> studied mathematics at school, but what I find quite interesting or quite entertaining is that she couldn't actually find a job in math, and so she decided to become a historian instead because she thought that would be easier. Um, so she ends up going, traveling to Puerto Rico, traveling to South America and Spain, and ends up getting involved in, in, in the field of history. So specifically, her, her greatest contribution, which I believe is still to this day, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is that she created one of the most complete biographical books of Christopher Columbus's crew members, um, which apparently had never been done before. And so she is for being in the, um, the libraries there and just going through all of these old papers and then really putting in quite a lot of hours. She never married. She never had any children. So this, this was, this was her life's work essentially. And she really devoted herself to it. Um, the other woman on this, on the right-hand side of the screen there is Mary Agnes Reardon, who was an liturgical artist, also a portrait artist, uh, and also a professor of arts at Emmanuel college. Uh, she was born in Quincy in 1912. Uh, went to Quincy High School, then went to Radcliffe and did her postgraduate or did her graduate work at Yale uh, and continued working as an artist after that, just continuous, continuously working on her craft. Uh, at one point, she actually gets tapped to design mosaics for the, some, uh, some of the liturgical mosaics at the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. That is probably one of the, her more famous pieces that she's done. Um, and then she, in, the in, I believe, 1950, she was tapped to become a professor at Emanuel. And I know, Ed, you had, I think you had something else that you wanted to say about her. Well, I, I think that she enters the story at this point is kind of a reflection of, as we kind of move through time here, of the, uh, the growing diversity of Quincy uh, as we go now really into deep into the 20th century. Um, the women we've talked about so far, with the exception clearly of the Squaw Sachem, is um, they're all essentially descendants of the colonial English uh, Protestant, for want of a better word, Yankee establishment. Mary Agnes Reardon clearly is an Irish American and, and a Catholic. So her movement into a, a position of prominence is just a reflection of what's happening to the city in general it has become a far more diverse, uh, far more uh, multicultural kind of place by the late 30s, early 40s, into going into the 50s. Um, 
So she's significant in her own right, and she's sort of significant in a kind of sociological way that way for Quincy as well. Um, so now moving into the sphere of business, um, I want to first of all talk about uh, Christiana and Genevieve Lee. Now, some of you who may have might be members of the Historical Society or who follow our blog, follow our Facebook page, you might recognize these two names. And Joseph Lee being a uh, inventor, hotelier, also a caterer, very and very, very, uh, very wealthy, or very wealthy, and very um, successful black man in this period in Mass in the um, latter half of the 1800s in Massachusetts, and also the the first decade, the first decade of the 1900s. So Joseph Lee, he dies, or in 1910, and when he dies, he was actually, or excuse me, he dies in 1908. Um, and when he dies, he was the manager, the general manager of the Squantum Inn, obviously the Squantum Inn here in Squantum, Massachusetts, or, or Squantum, Quincy. Um, and he had made that inn extremely, su extremely successful. And when he died, his wife and daughter, Christiana and Genevieve Lee, end up opening their own inn. And they call it Lee's Inn. Now, unfortunately, I don't have... Um, any photographs of either Christiana or Genevieve um, from what I there were, it was very hard to find photographs of Joseph Lee too, which is unfortunate because most of the women that we're talking about tonight are white women. Uh, Christiana and Genevieve Lee were both black women. They were very su successful in um, running uh, Lee's in after uh, their husband and father's death. And it, they continued to run it and operate it. Um, until about 1916 when Christiana died. Uh, and before being married to Lee, Christiana had actually been a school teacher as well. So she was, and she always had a hand in her husband's business. And so was, they were a very close family and, and did quite a lot. Unfortunately, I have, we have not yet been able to determine what happens to Genevieve and their other children after Christiana dies. So that might be, that was definitely an area of further study that we want to look into. Um, but this was a, a uh, a story that has come to us recently, and we're very excited about um, sharing it, because as you can tell. <laughs> um, and then on the left-hand side of the screen, or excuse me, right-hand side of the screen, uh, we have Sherry McCoy, who is a scientist and the former CEO of Avon Products. So she was also the vice chairman of the Johnson & Johnson Corporation for a while, and has degrees in both textile chemistry and chemical engineering. She also holds several patents. Um, and for about five years in a row, she was listed as uh, one of America's top 50 most powerful women in business by Forbes magazine. So she was in, very successful uh, in her career. Anything to add here, Ed? No, I think you covered that pretty well. That's good. All right, moving into sports. Now, I know that a lot of people were very excited when I, uh, or, um, or I saw people commenting on the advertisements for this program, talking about Mary Pratt and, and, and sharing some uh, recollections of her. So I know that people are probably very excited to <laughs> have me talk about her. So um, yeah, Mary Pratt is, is absolutely someone that Quincy should be proud of. You know, she's a uh, professional baseball pitcher in the All-American Girls Professional ba Baseball League. Uh, she was originally born in Connecticut in 1918, but grew up in Quincy, graduated from North Quincy High School, and became a phys physical education teacher not long after that. Uh, and around 1943, she ends up um, stopping being a physical education teacher because she gets asked to join this professional league and play baseball professionally. Uh, first up, she's picked up by the Rockford Peaches. Then she is uh, picked up by the Kenosha Comets the following uh, uh, season in 1944. And she continued to play professionally until 1947, at which point she came back to Quincy, where she continued to teach PE for the rest of her career, both in Quincy public schools and in Braintree schools. So she has been a local, uh, sort of a local celebrity, a local hero. Uh, for a long time. And also fun, fun fact is that uh, the league that um, she served in served as the basis uh, for uh, the movie that I am blanking on the name of, if you can help me out here. Ed. A League of Their Own. A League of Their Own. Yes. The very famous Gina Davis movie, uh, League of Their Own. 
Um, but Quincy also has quite a few other, Quincy has so many really interesting sports stories. So many sports uh, individuals, uh, players have been, who are from here, uh, including two Olympic medalists that are, are up on the screen right now. Uh, first up on the left-hand side, you have Mildred Wiley, who was an Olympic high jumper. Uh, she was born in 1901 and uh, won the bronze medal at the uh, 1928 Summer Olympics in Amsterdam. Fun fact, she was also um, the mother of Bob D, who later went on to become a Patriots player. Um, so sports were definitely in the family. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, we have Karen Cashman, who I'm sure many people recognize and remember this. Uh, she's an Olympic sports uh, short track speed skater and won the bronze medal at the 1994 Winter Olympics in Lillehammer. Um, anything to add there, Ed? I think that's it, yeah. <laughs> many, so uh, many great accomplishments, certainly. Yeah, we should maybe thank uh, Karen Cashman Lehman for the photo that, that we did get from her. Oh, yes, so, that, yeah. yes. Her, um, yeah, she was uh, very, we contacted her a few years, or about a year or two ago when we were working on our book, the Quincy Book of Days, yeah. And she was very kind to allow us to use two images, uh, this being one of them, uh, yeah. for that book. Uh, so now we move into the arts. And I define this very broadly because there's a lot of different things that we could be talking about here. Um, and first up, we're going to talk a little, we're going back in time again. We're going back to the uh, 1800s. Uh, we're going to talk about yet some more Quincy women. Um, Ed, do you want to take it away from here? So. <laughs> We'll give it a try. <laughs> uh, we are, yes, we're back now in the early years of the 1800s. We're looking, we're now kind of in the first half to, I think she passed away in 1874, if I remember correctly. Uh, so the first three quarters of the, of the 19th century, uh, born in 1798. This is Eliza Susan Quincy. She is the daughter of Josiah Quincy, the great mayor of Boston, the uh, president of Harvard College. Uh, she is therefore the granddaughter of Josiah Quincy, the patriot and law partner in the Boston massacre case with John Ad uh, Adams. Um, she is one of five sisters that um, their great grandnephew, uh, as we see here, characterized as the articulate sisters because they were all such uh, eloquent or articulate writers. Um, Eliza Susan was also a quite talented artist. She did a number of landscape types of uh, watercolors, uh, all of which have been collected and are in the collection of the Massachusetts Historical Society, many of which are of areas in Quincy. And I really wind up being one of our primary sources for information about the look of Quincy at that time. Uh, the only way we know what the original Quincy home, uh, homestead, the very first one built by the very first Edmund Quincy, uh, what it looked like is a, is a verbal description by Eliza Susan of what it looks like because nobody apparently ever bothered, even though it lasted until the 1890s, to take a photo of it before they tore it down. So it's in, a, it's in some corners of some other pictures of, of the Dorothy Cube, but that's about it. But she did these very talented um, watercolors. She wrote uh, in her journal uh, voluminously. She also apparently did two pieces of pretty significant uh, editorial work. She edited her grandfather's, that's Josiah Quincy the Patriots, papers and published the first really documentary biography of his life in the 1820s called Memoirs of Josiah Quincy. But she insisted that her father, the great mayor, be listed on the title page as the editor. And only in the second edition, which was, I think, in the 1860s or early 1870s, did she even take any partial credit for it. And then again, she may have done the same thing for her father after he passed away, in that she edited his papers into the first edition, um, and then insisted that her brother be put on the title page as the editor. So we're seeing that same, and then her four sisters are known only to the extent that um, their grandnephew went through their old diaries and, and published them back in the 1940s as part of the passages from them as part of this book. So we're in that same kind of 
curious phenomena. It's maybe not even curious, uh, but of the of the first half of the 19th century, of these really remarkably talented women that not only, um, and I think in the case of Eliza Susan, felt it was only right and proper that they kept this amount of talent and, and skill at a kind of domestic level, that it was not to go out into the world. Although she was a huge fan of Jane Austen and wound up, uh, uh, Austen had, had died, but she corresponded with Austen's brother. And she also um, corresponded with the, the writer Maria Edgeworth, but I guess it never occurred to her herself that she would take herself into the public sphere because I think it was considered not seemly in some way. Um, and the second half of the 19th century is where that begins to change and become, and, and the women begin to come out more into, the, into their fore as we've been seeing. Uh, one artistic note that I do want to add uh, to this is that when we look at that watercolor landscape, it that is not a black and white scan of a color photo. Uh, Eliza Susan deliberately um, and almost entirely only did her uh, pieces in watercolor and specifically in monochrome, mm -hmm. um, black and white, uh, which was just an interesting artistic note. She didn't. She took so many art classes, but she didn't like. I, I found some um, uh, documentation saying that she didn't. She really didn't like um, oil painting. She pr much preferred just to use pencil and then color over it with um, watercolors. So, so an, an interesting artistic note mm -hmm. there. Um, continuing with in the arts. Uh, we are going to talk about three of Quincy's more famous actresses, among other, uh, in, at least in the case of Ruth Gordon. She also had a number of other uh, accomplishments under her belt. But one of the, the really fun ones that we like to bring up on occasion uh, is on the right-hand side of your screen, um, Auntie M. Clara Blandick, the actress who played Auntie M, was from Quincy. <laughs> um, there's... That is definitely her most well-known role uh, is from The Wizard of Oz, but she was born here in Quincy in 1895, lived uh, and lived here as a child. Um, so something that uh, it's very much a sort of fun fact piece of trivia is that Auntie M is actually a, a Quincy re or was a Quincy resident. Um, and then of course we have, if we're gonna be talking about Quincy women in the arts, we have to talk about Ruth Gordon, absolutely. Um, so Ruth Gordon, of course, is most famous as an actress, um, having won the Academy, an Academy Award for um, Best Supporting Actress in, for her performance in Rosemary's Baby. She's also extremely uh, well known for her performance as the titular Maud in Harold and Maud. Um, and but she, yeah, she was born in Quincy in 1896 um, and graduated from Quincy High School. She acted in theater. She, she was, what's very interesting about her career is that she never seemed to look down on any role. She, she took whatever role was given to her and sort of throughout her career, you might, looking through the list of it chronologically, you sort of look at it and go, well, you know, you've, by this point you won an Academy Award. Why are you doing sort of made for TV movies? But, you know, she never really, she always, she always took a role no matter what it was, I, I think. Um, but she did. She acted in theater, film, television. Um, but slightly less well known is that she's also a playwright. Uh, she wrote a number of screenplays that did get made into movies, as well as teleplays for television episodes that did get made, and as well as several books. So she was also a very accomplished writer. Um, so slightly less well known about her. Um, Ed, do you want to take Lee Remick? Sure. Um... Lee Remick, I think, is probably, uh, if, if Ruth Gordon locally is, is sort of the best known, Lee Remick, I think, is maybe the most, uh, people seem to have a particular affection for Lee Remick, because I think she's a, even though Ruth Gordon came back many times in her later years and had a real affection for Quincy, I think because Lee was a little closer to time for a number of uh, people that are still, including myself, alive today, uh, she feels a little closer maybe to, to Quincy people. I think also the connection with the store. She is, of course, the daughter of Frank Remick, um, the proprietor of Remick's department store, which was the mainstay, the um, really the what would now be called the anchor store for the downtown Quincy shoppers town uh, boom years of the mid 20th century. Um, the She was born and had her early childhood here. Uh, her parents separated and she did 
had later years, spent her later years in Connecticut and uh, in New York City, and kind of, uh, but went on to first some roles on Broadway and then early live television, and then beginning in the 1950s until her far too early death at the age of 56 in the early 1990s was in uh, really some of the best, uh, most memorable movies um, of that time period, including Face in the Crowd and uh, the uh, the screen version of Sanctuary. And I'm pulling a blank on what is her really break. Oh, Anatomy of a Murder, which is her real breakout role. Um, and uh, if you're a habituary of Turner classic movies, uh, those two films were actually just shown, both of those films were just shown in the last couple of weeks on, on TCM. Uh, late in her life, she did a lot more TV. And uh, when asked about that, she also was nominated for an Academy Award for, um, I think, Anatomy of a Murder, although I may be wrong for that, and was in the original Broadway cat. She was the original Broadway star for Wait Until Dark, which was made into a movie with Audrey Hepburn. Uh, I think she got a really ter- yeah. She was nominated for Tony. I don't think she won, but she she was nominated for it. Uh, later in her life, uh, when they when asked why she wasn't making movies any uh, longer or why she wasn't making as many, she said, "I make movies for grownups, and when they go back to making movies for grownups again, I'll start making movies again." So she had she had standards as <laughs> as as they all did. Um, if I can circle back to Ruth just for a second. Uh, Years ago, the play she wrote about her childhood or her teenage years and wanting to be an actress in Wollaston, of course, uh, was actually a, a big hit on Broadway with Frederick March. And then is, uh, again, a movie that you can find regularly uh, or you can get, uh, you know, or you can stream on all sorts of services called The Actress with uh, Spencer Tracy playing playing her father, her, her father's role. So she was, she was a triple threat and, and she went on the length of her career is just amazing. 1914 to 1989 for Ruth Gordon, which is just an amazingly long career, uh, you know, which you referenced the number of things that she did. Yeah, Ned, if you want to maybe talk about Abigail Adams Homans. Um, Abigail Adams Homans is, I'm trying to think of how, what the best way to describe her is. She, she is kind of the glorious end of the line for, famous Adamses uh, in, a, in a very unlikely way. She is a daughter of the fourth generation of Adamses. Um, she is the daughter of John Quincy Adams II. So she is the daughter of Charles Francis Adams, who was the, um, she's the granddaughter of Charles Francis Adams, who was the ambassador to England during the Civil War. She is the niece of the, uh, three very f- the three famous Adamses of the fourth generation Charles Francis Jr who was important in history and also in writing uh, Brooks Adams who was important as a historian and Henry who was important as a historian and a creative writer both um, she grew up here in Quincy her father, John Quincy Adams, died when she was still a child. And so, to some extent, the uncles took her a little bit under their wing. And many years later, in 1963, she wrote a memoir of that called Education by Uncles, um, which has um, a remarkably unsentimental but affectionate take on them and on their whole life in general. Uh, the first or the second page of the book says the Quincy in which I grew up is dead as a dodo. And uh, she goes on to say that it's a good thing, too, that the, the, that the city is dynamic and that it changes. She moved on, of course, to to live in Boston to marry. Um, I'm going to fail to remember her her husband's uh, first name now, but you know, became sort of a Boston Brahmin, a Black Bay lady of um of grace and and stature until it died in the 1970s. But she was um, a kind of prototypical, uh, no nonsense, uh, don't give me any guff, uh, I'll give you sass right back kind of character. There are some uh, stories from her obituary that we found uh, uh, sort of speaking very bluntly. She uh, apparently in one point in the 19... 20s um, was uh, in the middle of a it was huge blizzard in Boston. She went into the Somerset Club, which uh, was the Tony 
Upper Crust, a private club in Boston, where her husband was a, a member. And uh, it's the middle of the night. And she comes in and she says, can you put me up, uh, give me a room for the night because it's too bad, too dangerous out there to try and get all the way home to Beacon Hill in this weather. And um, they said, they said, they stood on principle and they said, well, no, we can't do that. We, we can't give um, rooms out to see, regardless of your husband's a member, we can't give a room out to a woman by herself. And she said, okay, I'll go out and get my cab driver and bring him in, at which point they reneged and said, okay, you can have the room by uh, by yourself. And uh, she apparently uh, did that kind of sharp witted stuff all the way through her life. Um, and um, represents kind of you know, a different, but a, in some ways a kind of fitting coda to, to the whole Adams story um, as, and the, the relationship of the Adamses and Quincy's uh, and, the, and the city of Quincy. Uh, Elizabeth Ogilvie. Um, so Elizabeth Ogilvy is a, a novelist, um, and she is probably most well known for setting a lot of setting her stories in uh, along the coast of Maine. Um, so she was born in Boston, uh, but ended up in in 1917, uh, but then came and lived with her family in Quincy and graduated from North Quincy High School. Uh, and during the summer, she and her family would take trips up to the coast of Maine, and she just sort of fell in love with that area. Now, she never actually went to college, so she, but she did take, I think, a, a single writing course through Harvard University, but attributes a lot of her writing and her sort of passion for it to being encouraged by her teachers mm -hmm. at uh, North Quincy High School. Apparently, she had one in particular who uh, saw some of her writing and went, you, you could really make a career of this, and, that, and apparently she took that advice and just ran with it. Um, so her first novel ended up being published in 1944, and it was High Tide at Noon, uh, which you can see a, the, the poster for the movie adaptation of that, which was done in 1957, uh, actually by a, a British company as opposed to an American one. It's because her stories were very popular, even over in the UK as well, apparently, that they just, because she set some of her stories in Scotland, she set in Nova Scotia, and quite a lot in Maine, but... Um, people really seem to enjoy them. Uh, in total, she had she has 46 books uh, in her name and uh, spanning all books for adults, books for young adults, and also books for children as well. So she really has um, quite quite a collection uh, that she that she was able to um, uh, create over the course of her life. All right. So at this point, we have come to the part of the evening where we're gonna start wrapping things up. But first of all, before we actually do end things completely and, and start opening up for questions, um, I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we are actively working on researching at the Historical Society right now. So, um, because we know a lot about these individuals' women. As you can see, we, we've talked about about 20 or 30 here tonight. Um, but what's interesting is that for quite a few of them, there's a lot of gaps or there's maybe more that can be said about these individuals, but also generally um, when in terms of talking about some of the more overarching narratives of what life was like for women um, in cer certain parts of Quincy history, we don't know a lot. And part of the reason for that is because of a lack of the record for it. Uh, there just is simply a hole in the record. So we, we can't really, we don't know yet <laughs> because we just don't have the information. So one of the main uh, sort of themes and overarching research projects that we're doing over the next couple of years is studying the period of Quincy's transition from a town form of government, so and, and sort of a rural community to a fully industrial city form of and city form of government. So this spans a period from roughly the 1870s to around about 1830. Um, that's when you get more paved streets and that's a pretty uh, usually a pretty good sign that a, a city has become more industrial as if they have paved streets. Um, so and underneath this there are so many other topics that get covered by this period of history and what's also really interesting 
is that we don't know a lot about this period because the people who were taught, who were historians, local historians at the time, really weren't that interested in recording what was going on then. They, this is also coincidentally around the, same t- uh, in, around the same time that the Quincy Historical Society itself was founded. But our first mission as a society, our, our, our mission statement as it was when it was founded was, wasn't really interested in the things that were going on recently. Uh, it was more looking back in a sort of antiquarian style of, of history and, and really trying to preserve and talk about the, the revolutionary period and the, and the early Republic and, and such. Um, they just, they, there wasn't a lot of interest in recording these things. So we, we just, we, we have a, a lot of question marks in general about this period, but then also with these other um, topics that I have listed underneath, uh, women's experience, immigrant communities and the labor movement, these were huge factors within Quincy's community. And we can see sort of the negative shape of them within the record. We know they're there, we, but there, it's very hard to follow up on the actual uh, information and to find the information. So for example, in the women's experience, the lives of working women, a lot of times they're not written about in the local newspaper. So they don't, they, we just know very little. A lot of times they're also not keeping journals maybe. So we just don't have that information there either. The suffrage movement is the, one of the things that is the most surprising to me. Last summer uh, in correspondence to um, the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th amendment, um, one of the things that I was working on was trying to tease out what the actual story of the suffrage movement in Quincy was. And we can't find it. It's, it's, we know it's there. We know people who were involved in it in Quincy. We can see that it existed, but it's just not recorded in any way. And so it's becoming, it's difficult to find, and it's going to take a lot of work to really tease that out. And we just haven't had the opportunity to do so yet. Similarly, the temperance movement in Quincy was very much tied to the suffrage movement to a lot of the women's clubs and women's um, experience here. Um, And, um, Quincy was actually a dry city for almost, I think, 40 years prior to the passage of the 18th Amendment. So it was a dry city for far longer than uh, the the actual prohibition period in the rest of the United States, which is quite interesting. And so there's definitely a story there as well. And um, so all of these things that we do, we we know that they're there. We're just we we want to know more. Similarly, in the case of immigrant communities, we would love to be able to. Uh, give more stuff about daily lives and experiences. And then also where we have um, some act, some research that has already been done that we're in the process of getting ready to present uh, to the community about uh, their adaptation and integration into Quincy society and what that was like. Um, but that, that takes work that we're actively doing. Um, and similarly, the labor movement, we know that there was strong union presence in the shipyard and the quarries there. And that's written about frequently in the newspapers. It's just, we need to actually take the time to go through and uh, do all of that research and put together the story there. Um, So that brings me to the next slide here, which is we are going to need help (laughs) with this particular, with this research essentially. Um, And there's a lot of ways that people can help. And the first one, the number one thing that a community can do to help their their historical society to tell these stories is is for donations of historic photographs, letters, journals, pamphlets, ephemera, et cetera. Things that will tell us more information about this. So this is us sort of putting out the call in general um, to our community about you know, if you're ever looking through some old boxes or something and you stumble across something that you think might be of interest to us, give us right a first refusal um, in ter- before you throw something away. Because you never know what letter or journal or photograph might be a, a missing piece of information that we did not have before. And, we would, and, we, and once it's gone, it's gone. We'll never have that information. Um, now, of course, this is not to say that we're in, that we're asking you to part with, you know, a, a sentimental uh, family heirloom or uh, or, or uh, some, something with sentimental value. But even allowing us to cop, make copies of something would be incredibly helpful as well. And then, secondly, um, we always need volunteers. Um, Ed and I can't do all of this work ourselves. Um, this. 
to be able to do this work, it requires doing research of trawling through the newspapers, uh, going through all sorts of documents and, and, and spending time and taking time. And that is hard. Um, and uh, we are always having to, we have many different projects that we're trying to do simultaneously. And so if we have people who are interested in this particular uh, area of, or any of those areas of study, we would love to have help if you think it would be interesting to be reading through the old newspapers and and looking this up for us. And of course, you know, I, I have the picture of uh, the Winnie the Welders at the Four River Shipyards, a, a group of women welders. Um, you know, we've been talking mostly pre-World War II at this point, but also, you know, the stories, if you have family members who were um, welders or who were active, you know, in, in Quincy, you know, these, these are stories that the sooner that we can start getting these this information, the, the more likely we're gonna be able to put this, the keep it all together and and put a good picture together of what this was like. Um, and then, so the last slide here is, okay, so how do you actually get in touch with us? And best way always to get in touch with us is by email. And that's info at quinzyhistory.org. Um, that is our, our general sort of uh, inbox where we, that we monitor. It might take us a little while to get, get back to you. We, we apologize, um, but we, we do check that email address. Um, then you can always give us a call too. Um, we're, or we're not yet open. Uh, we have not yet reopened. We are hoping to be able to do so soon, uh, no, but we cannot give a, an exact date. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to get back to work on this. And then of course you can always follow us on Facebook and on our blog. And so on Facebook, we are the Quincy or we are Quincy Historical Society and Museum. So at Quincy History. And you can also find our blog at www.quincyhistory.org backslash blog, which has more information, articles about uh, all, all factors of Quincy history. Yeah. Um, so thank you all once again so uh, very much for joining us here tonight. I think um, I, we are ready to take some questions if anybody has any, if we still have time. We do, we have a few minutes. Excellent. Um, shall I stop sharing at this point or? Yeah, maybe, maybe just leave it up another minute in case anyone's oh, yeah. writing down the information. That makes sense. Um, we did have one question on one of the sites we were streaming to. Someone wanted to know uh, who was your favorite person that you researched during this project so far? Oh, um, I, th I, I have two, I personally have two answers to that. I definitely fell down a rabbit hole with Anne Hutchinson. Um, she will be making, she will be making more appearances just because I am suddenly very fascinated with her. And I think there, there's, there's more to, of that we can do with that story. Mm -hmm. Um, and just the period in general, it is so interesting. And of course, since we're, you know, we're coming up to the, uh, 400th anniversary, here in Quincy in 2025, um, that that would be <laughs> of uh, the period that that we could be talking about this. So that definitely expect to see more about Anne in, in the you know coming months and years uh, as we go forward. And then I also really was quite surprised that Mary Dusen um, that we haven't talked more about her uh, in Quincy. Um, because she was, you know, so influential uh, during the 1940s uh, um, in the Roosevelt administration and friends with Eleanor Roosevelt and everything and, and in the New Deal. And that's, that's incredibly significant that, that it was somebody from Quincy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so she's someone that I think, you know, will probably find an excuse to talk about her a little bit more as well. And Ed, was there anyone for you that really stood out? Well, I've always, I, I always have a real affection for Ruth Gordon. I just find her sort of uh, fascinating in, in so many different ways. And I, I, I suppose also many, many years ago, I actually bumped into her, but uh, which is a whole other story, which we'll tell some other time because it takes too long to, to, to tell. But, uh, and I keep, I, I think I'm fascinated by her because I was like totally tongue tied when I met her and didn't <laughs> know what to say. And I keep, keep trying to like, you know, even though it's too late, I keep trying to make up for it somehow. Uh, the two people that I think um, came out of this that I wasn't aware of and that really uh, Alexandra's research pulled up for me, uh, 
I, I knew of them, but I hadn't. I, I think do some definitely. Uh, but also Elizabeth Ogilvy is more. I'm I'm sort of curious to go out and find a little bit more about about her and her books. Um, I knew the name, but I hadn't really paid any attention uh, to her as as a writer. And she sounds actually like a pretty interesting writer. So uh, I, I'd like to maybe check out those books. You know, her writing a little bit. Very good. I did have someone ask what school uh, Karen Cashman went to. Ah, uh, that did not add to that. Did you I, I don't know, honestly. I mean, I, I don't know whether she, I, I would be guessing. Uh, Hang on, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat a little bit and do a quick Google. Uh, <laughs> if anybody has the answer, they want to put it in yeah, the also, chat. Yeah, we're we're, we're I, not I, proud. I, we'll take any help we can get. <laughs> oh, North Quincy High School found it. Okay. Well, we do have actually some people in the chat who had mentioned that they'd be interested in volunteering um, in the upcoming months. So I'm sure you can expect to get yeah. some some requests for help for that. That's and then yes. someone also pointed out that they were struck by the lack of public monuments for women in Quincy. Yeah, yeah. I, again, uh, if you have time for one anecdote, I, again, this is a number of years ago, not as many years ago as when I Ruth, met Ruth Gordon, but a number of years ago when uh, at the Academy one day, um, this visitor from Ireland walked in, what young a woman from Ireland walked in and uh, was interested in in, uh, in Follett and um, Catherine Follett and wanted to know where the public monument to Catherine Follett was because she wanted to go see it and take a picture of it. And I said, there isn't one. And she, she was dumbfounded. She said <laughs> she could not believe that this person could have lived here and that, that we would not have put a uh, some sort of public recognition to her up. And yeah, something, said, yeah. 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 something that struck me kind of tangentially related, not not really about monuments, but just I think that, you know, in, in any other community, um, any one of these women would be the the big yeah. uh, female uh, yeah. historical figure of that community. But because Quincy is just so remarkable and they have to have 50 of everything, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, they, unfortunately, a lot of these very remarkable people do get lost. But, you know, that's what, what that's what makes my job very fun is getting to tell people about this, because, you know, Quincy Quincy has so much to be proud of. Um, as far as the, the the people who have been from Quincy and, of course, a lot of the history of it. May I add something about Ruth Gordon? This is Emily. Sure. I guess. Uh, I yeah. Remember uh, when uh, under Mayor uh, Reyes' time, Ruth Gordon came to celebrate with us a uh, centennial of Quincy? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there was a big ball for her at the Lantana, and she was the guest of honor in so many events. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uh, was telling us how she made a commercial for the Zubaru for the uh, Super Bowl and how she banged that door and gave her the slam. And she said, because uh, she was a spunky actress, and so she was saying how much they paying for that one second commercial, it got millions of dollars. I remember her telling us the audience there uh, of, uh, of her work. And she had that red coat and her beret and was cold, cold. And she just made herself so available to people. Uh, she was a remarkable. Wouldn't it mm. be nice to have a Ruth Gordon statue somewhere in Quincy, just like Mary Tyler Moore, like in Minneapolis, and it's a meeting place for everybody. Meet you at the Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> Remember, I will. Me? I will point out that um, Annalee probably knows. Um, we do have on loan from the Quincy Art Association a really quite nice oil painting of, of Ruth Gordon by Edwina Kachi. Uh, you know, a, a of very course, good she's a well-known Quincy artist. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, good, good. That's a good thing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and one more thing about Lee Remick. I remember when she uh, played the role in the competition. It's a Van Clyburn competition where she played with uh, Dustin Hoffman, I believe, and it was mm. filmed in San Francisco in a, yeah. in a park there by Presidio. Mm. And uh, so that was another one of, of uh, Lee Remick's and she was so loved by Quincy. Mm -hmm. 
and we just adore her and went to see every movie let's yeah. see more yeah. scenes yeah. so yeah what and, she, and we all felt sad when she passed away it was yeah. like a yeah yeah. And she she yeah. remained uh, she remained she remained her ties to the city even though she had moved away much earlier than than Miss yes, Gordon. Yes, she did. was still Quincy girl. Yeah. Yeah. She she felt it too. Yeah. Thank you. Um. So I'll just ask one last question. Someone wanted to know about the watercolor by Eliza Susan Quincy. She said it appeared to be from the vantage point of Penn's Hill. Would this be the view that Abigail Adams would have had of Charlestown? So yeah, let's actually go back to that. Uh, slide just because it is it's kind of looking. so it, it's it's looking not quite in the right direction um but this is this is pretty pretty close it, i would say yeah. it's my guess too that it was that she did this um she got this view from pens hill i i think you're right there yeah. um but i think um i'm not i'm not sure you can see you can definitely see boston but i'm not sure you can see charlestown in that one. yeah yeah she probably you yeah, that, that's my feeling is that you probably have to move a little bit to the, your perspective would have to be a little further to the right to get the Charlestown view. But but that is absolutely where Abigail yeah. Adams and John Quincy Adams were standing when they watched the burning of Charlestown yeah. during the Battle of Bunker Hill. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, oh, sorry. And then one last one that just came in. Someone wanted to know what happened to the Abigail Adams and John Quincy Adams statues that were once besides the Granite Church. Do we know where those are? uh we so ed go ahead <laughs> they are according to the information that i have they are safe uh they are in storage they are perfectly preserved and they are, are waiting um a few things are going on that may have them back on public display in, in a new and a very appropriate location but that but don't not to worry they know nothing's happened to them they're okay they they're they're fine <laughs> Well, thank you both very much. The feedback that I've seen um, on our streaming platforms has been overwhelmingly positive. People have loved the presentation. Um, I'm glad to hear it. So much for all the work that you've done to preserve the history for the city of Quincy's women. Always. Um, and also for those who are interested in volunteering, um, please just do get in touch with us. Email is always the best or you can um, always contact us on Facebook too. Yeah. Um, I, I'm the one who manages the Facebook page. Um, so yeah, just get in contact and hopefully, you know, uh, when everything, when the current circumstances start clearing up a bit, we can start getting people in to, to help us with some stuff. Very good. Thank you both so much. Thank you very much. Thank, and okay. thanks everyone for joining us here tonight. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.